Marcelo Mañasco, and I'm a, a professor and head of laboratory at Rockefeller University in New York. Back at the beginning of the century, a, a, an astronomer named Carl Shaw decided to try to uh, date a passage in the Odyssey that has been interpreted by many since classical times as being a description of an eclipse. It's a little bit of a difficult passage to try to interpret as an eclipse because the passage takes place indoors and the suitors who are supposed to be seeing this omen do not see it. Uh, but otherwise the description of an eclipse uh, uh, by a seer is very vivid. And so Carl Shaw tried to date this, uh, uh, this eclipse and he found that the only possible date would have been uh, April 16, 1178 BC, which would agree rather well with the classical estimates of the fall of Troy around 1190 BC, okay, plus the ten years it takes for Odysseus to go back. We took this and we said, okay, if, if this is the only evidence that you find in the Odyssey, it's just a so-so story, right? You can't, it's neither here or there, right? What are you going to do? Uh, you can't corroborate it by any means just looking at the clips. However, in the Odyssey, there's plenty of other references to things that happen in the sky. Uh, there's a reference to Odysseus navigating by the stars, there's a reference to seeing Venus high in the sky, and so what we did was we set aside the eclipse reference and we just took the rest of the other references. And uh, looking at all those other references, we found that because each one of them happens frequently, but in combination all four of them would happen very rarely, we were able to say that the only date compatible with these other references was also April 16, 1178 BC. So this gives us uh, what we believe is a full independent confirmation that on that date might be a date that's actually inscribed in the Odyssey. Yes, so uh, the eclipse being described would be a total solar eclipse lasting a few minutes as they typically do and uh, the narrative takes place at noon so that's a, 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 an important datum. Total solar eclipses are very short and they are seen over a very small uh, swath of the earth uh, because the size of the moon and the size of the sun are the apparent size of the moon and the, the sun are so nearly identical that when the moon covers the sun you have to be exactly at one given position and it doesn't last very long. So uh, the description would be compatible with a total solar eclipse. The description says that it happens at noon. Indeed the 16th April 1178 BC uh, eclipse happened uh, close to noontime local time over the Ionian Islands. So, uh, yeah, in, in addition, that particular eclipse would have been pretty impressive because you had all of the planets, all of the visible naked eye planets, all of them simultaneously in the sky, in, in a relatively small uh, fraction of the sky as the, as the eclipse happened. So it would have been a, a pretty, impressive, uh, pretty impressive phenomenon. We have, there has been a huge uh, debate that I haven't followed in all of its intricacies regarding the Dark Wine Sea. So at some point there was, uh, there was an idea that uh, wine at the time was uh, way too strong to be drunk without diluting and as you diluted it, it acquired certain colorations that looked like the sea. Uh, uh, there uh, has been an entire thread of people looking at that. It doesn't help that we really don't know exactly from the Homeric language. Uh, some of even the words are still under dispute exactly what they mean. Uh, clearly wine dark sea is not something that we would call today 
the sea, okay, but we don't have the same wine today as they had in those times. So uh, I, I really don't know about, uh, yeah. about how to interpret that. Yeah. What, what I can say, on the other hand, is that whenever uh, you read the description of sailing, the description is extremely vivid in exactly, you know, how they, you know, they have the mask, how they, you know, they pull the ropes. Uh, the person narrating seems to know very, very well what he's talking about. So uh, clearly, if uh, if they, you know, if they are describing the sea as being, you know, wine in coloration, probably their wine was indeed the color of the sea or something like that. So, um, hearing is a difficult sense to understand from the theoretical viewpoint because it is pretty much unlike the other senses in, in, many, in many relevant ways. So, for instance, we have, in both our retinas, we have about 200 million photoreceptors. Uh, so, each one of our eyes is a 100 megapixel camera. Uh, we have about 100 million uh, olfactory receptors in, a, in our noses. We have well over 10 to 20 million uh, receptors for touch and for pain and for temperature on our skin. Uh, yet the total number of auditory receptors we have in both of our cochlea is something like seven to 8,000. So there's a minuscule amount of cells that are being input from sound and therefore the nervous system really needs to extract as much information as it can from every each one of them okay the information density being coerced out of each one of these uh, detectors is is much higher so it puts a lot of demand on the capability of the of of the nervous system to process information in addition, we do not understand very well sound, exactly what the geometry of sound is in the sense that we can understand vision. We hear some words, okay, we hear a few seconds of, of phonemes, and these give rise to a multitude of very different percepts in your brain. So on one, on one side, one stream you get out is the actual text being spoken. Then you also hear the, the accent of the speaker, the emotional stance of the speaker, uh, many features related to the identity of the speaker. If you know somebody, you can easily recognize their voice, but even if you don't know them, you immediately know whether it's male or female, a, a child, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, all of these are impressions that uh, are sort of separated by the brain into different percepts that do not go with the same stream. So it's uh, sort of difficult to try to uh, understand in, unified, in a unified sense what is it exactly that our hearing does. Then there is all the spatial aspects of hearing that we normally attribute to our sight, but actually a lot of them are derived from, from hearing. So when you hear somebody speaking, uh, you know perfectly well if they are talking towards you or towards a wall. You know whether they're turned around or not simply because of the muffling that would happen if the, if the speaker is, 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 is looking away from you. Uh, you know the position of the speaker with a fair uh, amount of accuracy we have very precise models in our brain of how the human voice sounds when you are yelling or when you're whispering. And of course the nervous system is measuring the volume of the sound at the ear, so you can distinguish whether somebody is whispering in your ear from somebody shouting far away, even though the volume at the ear would be precisely the same simply because you can interpret whether the pattern of the sound is that of a stressed voice, stressed because of shouting, or, or, or the muffled sound of somebody, somebody whispering. Uh, 
you also have a clear impression of the space on which the conversation takes place. Uh, this is, for instance, a very, the space I mean, is a very quiet uh, space because echoes have been suppressed, uh, but not entirely. Uh, you have an impression, for instance, everybody is probably familiar with somebody in their house calling them from a different room and from the sound of the voice knowing exactly in which room they are. Okay, If somebody calls you from the bathroom, you recognize that the shininess in the bathroom walls. Uh, you would recognize the more muffled sound of somebody calling you from the bedroom where, you know, mattress and stuff uh, absorb uh, sound. So there are all these uh, variety of different percepts and so it's sort of difficult to try to integrate auditory studies into, into a single category because the brain itself is separating different attributes of the source uh, and different attributes of the space on which the communication is taking place uh, in, a, in a very rapid and automatic fashion. We keep an interest in human perception of fairly complex and sort of idiosyncratic sounds like perception of, of music and the like. Uh, because that's ultimately what we are interested in, in understanding, how human beings understand their world, right? Uh, but we need to simplify uh, our space of hypothesis. And so there has been historically in, in neuroscience studies a, a little bit of a tension between two, uh, two extremes in sensory research. In one, you try to present uh, a, a subject, an experimental animal, a, a person, with extremely simplified stimuli. Like in vision, it would be just a dot of light, a single line, a, a grating, you know, regular spacing of, of, of bars or something like that. These are extremely abstract stimuli, but on the other hand, they are very easily described mathematically in terms of a very small number of parameters. So if I'm describing to you a dot of light, its only attributes are its position, horizontal and vertical position on some screen. Therefore, a the approach has a lot of power in trying to see if a particular neuron in my brain or in the brain of, a, of, a, 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 of an animal responds to dots of light. Does it respond specifically to dots that happen in a specific location? Then it's relatively easy to go and reconstruct exactly what is it that's causing this neuron to respond. Okay. On the other hand, these stimuli are extremely artificial, they are unrelated to the forces that shaped the evolution of the brain, and uh, it has been extremely difficult to try to put together much more complex uh, scenes from these very simple elements. So if we try to study then uh, how uh, neurons in the brain respond to combinations of lines, the number of parameters blows, blows up so rapidly that it has proven very difficult to get a lot, a lot of insight out of the root of building the world, you know, one line or one simple element at a time. Another school of thought, yeah? Sure. So uh, another school of thought has said, on the other hand, let's try to do what the brain is supposed to do. The brain wasn't evolved so that we could recognize dots and lines. The br brain was evolved so that we could recognize uh, our predators, our prey, our mates in the context of a natural visual scene, like a wood or something like that. So how do we recognize the presence of our, one of our predators? Do we see a lion among the, among the leaves? How do we uh, find our mates? Uh, these are very complex natural scenes, but this is what the brain was evolved to do. So people have said, okay, let's look at what characterizes natural scenes, as opposed to random television snow, which is the most random possible stimulus. Okay, what characterizes the very structured uh, scenes of the natural world? Unfortunately, those, uh, those uh, scenes are uh, uncontrolled. 
mathematically speaking. Namely, you go out in the wood, you make a film, and you present it uh, to your subject, and you'll see whatever your neurons respond to, but you do not have the power that you had in the previous approach of this very tight mathematical description. So what we've been looking for in the, in the auditory world is to try to find sounds that are natural, that are ecologically relevant to the given, to the given animal, in the sense that being a sound that an animal has been evolved to recognize and to find or flee from, and uh, that we can describe in mathematical terms uh, in, in very closed form. And we have been studying what we call auditory textures. These are sounds that occur sort of in, in steady state, uh, so that one piece of the sound sounds quite like any other piece of the sound. Uh, for instance, uh, the sound of running water, you're next to a brook, you hear blah, 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 and you hear that sound continuously, and if you record it for an hour, the first minute and the last minute sound exactly alike. Uh, the sound of fire, a fireplace crackling, that's a very nice steady sound, which is statistically homogeneous, so you can look at one part and another part and nothing has changed or, uh, you know, the sound of flies buzzing in the air, or any other, you know, natural sound that has this, uh, you know, this constancy. And then we try to take these sounds and abstract them so that we can describe them and resynthesize them computationally with the minimum possible number of parameters. In the case of water, uh, we have found the remarkable way of actually synthesizing a very accurate sound of running water with only three parameters, making it virtually uh, as low dimensional, as mathematically tightly controlled as one line on a, on a, on a blackboard. So, uh, and this approach then, you know, is trying to unite the power of, you know, the low dimensional description of the simple stimulus with using a very natural and, and ecologically relevant sound, like the sound of running water. Every living being needs to be able to recognize water and go and find water or run away from water in case of a flood. So uh, these are sounds that the brain was evolved to recognize very, very efficiently. And, uh, and this is where we stand. We're, st we're studying, we're trying to study how the brain recognizes these classes of sounds uh, and how it, how it can parse them and categorize them. Yes, indeed. So, uh, so in, in, in fact, we believe that, uh, or we attribute internally to vision most of our understanding of the space around us, but a lot of it happens because of an auditory reconstruction that is linked to the, to the visual rec uh, reconstruction. And it it, it, this process begins as early as, uh, as a newborn who will turn uh, their head towards the sound of their mother's voice looking for the face. Now, uh, in experiments in which you uh, present a subject in darkness with a flash and a click of sound coming from the same place, and you ask them, okay, please point to the place where that happened. If you move away this auditory source of the click and the, uh, and the flash, but they still happen simultaneously, but in a different place, the person still perceives them as being a single source, as being a single object. And they will point to a, 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 to a point in between the, the flash and the, and the sound of the click, which is roughly one third of this, you know, towards the, towards the light and two thirds towards the click. Meaning that uh, internally the brain is using both the evidence from hearing as well as the evidence from vision to try to reconstruct the location of that, uh, of that uh, particular event. And it's roughly weighting vision twice as much as hearing. Uh, but this is, you know, relatively surprising. We would think that actually we, we, th we see the pla precise place where things happen. 
and we sort of hear, you know, something very broad, but, but it is not so. Our uh, hearing uh, acutely helps us to have a very detailed imagery of the world. And again, coming back to my previous point, this is surprising because the amount of primary sensory receptors that are used for hearing is so much smaller than the ones that are used for, for vision that there is a substantial amount of information processing that the nervous system devotes to coercing this information out of the auditory stream. I wouldn't say that any of our senses is more powerful than the other. All of them are necessary for their own uh, intended uh, uh, purposes, right? So vision has certain, um, certain special attributes. It's very high resolution in the amount of information it conveys to the brain per unit of time. It also requires the brain to really interpret the scene it's looking at in ways that require some amount of time. Hearing is closer to, to the sense of smell in having a privileged connection to the emotions. It's much more easy to have a sound that changes our, our emotional stance than to have a, a, a visual scene that changes our emotional stance. And it's sort of much more automatic, right? Everybody is familiar with uh, the calming sound of rain on a rooftop or the alarm that the roar of a lion uh, will, uh, will give you. Uh, so, you know, it's it's very common to go to the to the zoo and see the kids, uh, you know, looking at the lion, and then the lion roars, and all of the kids go scampering out. Okay, because looking at the lion is much more of an intellectual thing than actually hearing the roar of the lion that the brain uh, has been evolved to actually fear, and that's why we actually use alarm clocks to wake us up. Uh, the hearing sense is on all the time, right? We recognize sounds as we sleep uh, and they will wake us up from, uh, from, uh, from sleep if, if need be. Uh, so they serve very different purposes, all the senses, right? Uh, I believe it was Helen Keller who was both uh, blind and deaf that said that uh, blindness separated her from things, while deafness separated her from people. And that of, uh, of the two senses, the most devastating lack was the lack of communication with other people. So uh, this is one of the ways in which uh, you, can, you can see that these senses really have different use and different power. If you think of memory, you know, memory is an all-encompassing all term, uh, uh, going from just being able to integrate the last few hundred milliseconds of your sensory experience together, that requires memory, right? Because that, you know, a few hundred milliseconds a second is longer than the direct uh, uh, memory of most neurons. It requires integrating everything uh, in, in an intermediate structure, which is, you know, short-term memory. There's many different forms of memory and uh, it's... I stalled there, right? It's... Uh, uh, it's an all, it really is an all-encompassing word in that we call memory very, very different things. Uh, my interest at the theoretical level in, uh, uh, in memory has to do with the lack of theoretical models for what we call normal in memory, namely 
uh, we have a fairly good artificial neural net models for implicit associations or for you know implicit recognition of categories and the like. So if we show a number of examples of a category or a number of examples of occurrences, we can build neural, uh, artificial neural networks. These are artificial computational structures, okay, which we run on the computer, that look at these categorizations and eventually learn from the presentation of examples how to, you know, how to categorize certain things. So uh, that we know how to do, but in, in common language, memory is a very different thing. And in common language, basically everything I remember happened to me exactly once. It wasn't like uh, you get these many different examples uh, and you categorize from them, you, re you recall very vividly instances uh, that happened to you, like I said, precisely once. So I, uh, I remember vividly the birth of each one of my children. Uh, I do not have just some category called birth of children. I recall each one of them. Uh, I uh, recall my first day of school. It happened to me just once. Uh, well, I recall my first day of elementary school and I recall my first day of high school. Okay? And I recall them as two different instances, not as two examples of first days of, the, of schools. Right? So uh, we do not have much by way of a theoretical understanding of how the brain could do this. Okay? We don't have very uh, well-developed models of a, a sort of a neural network uh, taking all of these data from the world and assembling them into some, uh, into some uh, a coherent thing we call then memory, uh, whereby if we recall it, we remember things that happened on one specific occasion that we saw precisely once. Right? So that's, uh, uh, that's an interest I have, but uh, I have to say that uh, you know, we don't have uh, currently a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of results in the subject. I should really research the origin of the 10% of the brain meme, uh, which is wildly repeated uh, in, in many places. I don't know exactly what the original uh, statement was referring to, but uh, probably it was referring to the fact that the neurons in the brain, the neurons in the cortex of the brain, uh, fire sparsely, in the sense that they are not uh, you know, active all the time sending uh, electrical impulses. They, uh, they fire at much lower rates than their, you know, that they would be capable of uh, hardware-wise. But this does not mean that they are not in use all the time. Uh, namely, a, a neuron being silent means something, uh, as opposed to not meaning anything. And therefore, I, I, I really have no idea what it would mean to say we are only using 10% of, of, the, of the brain. Uh, as far as I'm aware, everybody uses most of the brain most of the time. Uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly how. <laughs>